I wanted to tell a new story about American history. This is a very complex story that involves violence. It's a story that involves trauma. It's a story that has current day implications of drowning. Knowing that no one had written about the social and cultural history of swimming pools, public swimming pools in particular, I interpreted that as a significant responsibility. And so how do we tell this story and also provide pathways forward? How do we tell this story and have it be uplifting? How do we tell this story and help it shape the future instead of getting stuck in the past? The Fairmont Waterworks, its founding, when it went into operation back in 1815, it was designed to provide fresh drinking water to the citizens of Philadelphia. So the city's founding fathers at the time, they looked towards the Schuylkill River, and they looked at the topography of the area, and they decided to build a pumping station on uh, what they called Fairmount, which is where the art museum is now standing. It was once the reservoir to the Fairmont Waterworks. And they built this incredible, what we see now today, the Fairmont Waterworks, not quite the size it is today. It was pretty much the engine house and what we call the old mill house. And the mission was really about how to create a safe place, produce drinking water, how to create a beautiful public space so that citizens have an opportunity to sort of marvel at this technology. And the architecture of the site was also to sort of celebrate the innovation and um, the embracement of technology, but also blending that with a classical design, celebrating Philadelphia as the capital of the nation and as a place that recognizes its civic responsibility to provide not just drinking water, but beauty. Eventually, the waters of the Schuylkill River became too polluted for people to be able to safely drink. So the waterworks did not have the space in order to build filtration and add a chlorination system. By 1911, the Fairmont Waterworks was sort of decommissioned as a, a drinking water facility. In 2015, I was asked to be a part of um, uh, an envisioning uh, charrette for the waterworks to help the city and uh, their stakeholders plan for the future. My company, Habitech, focuses on environmental education, really connecting the public to the natural world. And I do that through storytelling and the connection of art and science. The fish continues on its way, carrying the baby mussels to its new home. I had just recently been hired by the Philadelphia Water Department to help revitalize and reactivate this incredible complex. And I started reading everything I could about water. And I stumbled upon a book by Dr. Jeff Wilt called Contested Waters. This book chronicles this social history of swimming in America. It takes us from the 1880s to present day. And I was someone who could swim before I could walk. For my entire life, swimming has been a joy, a freedom. Everyone's graceful. And so when I read Dr. Wiltz's book, I just was so impacted by it. This very watery world, there's this 100-year history of exclusion and that it has present-day implications. When I started to work on the book, I did spend a lot of time researching and writing about the history of pools in Philadelphia. And part of that because Philadelphia was the most prolific early builder of municipal pools. And those early pools were actually public baths and they date to the 1880s and 1890s. One of the important things that I found is that while of course these pools were gender segregated, males and females use different pools or the same pool at different times, they weren't racially segregated. During the 1920s and 1930s, cities throughout the country began building large resort-like swimming pools. And city officials wanted families and really the community as a whole, with one exception, 
to be able to use these pools together. And so when cities allowed males and females to swim together, that's when white public officials and white swimmers suddenly objected to the presence of African Americans. This must look like a big wow. change from the last yeah. time you were here. <laughs> That, oh, it looks amazing. Yeah, and this is where the stadium seating will be, and then here is your canvas. <laughs> cool. I mean, the crazy part is that when it was a pool, people remember these columns in it. Yeah. And swimming around the columns in 1960s. I got the invitation to work on the project after Victoria and I discovered we were both curious about working on projects that dealt with pool segregation. For me, I was curious about why so many uh, people that I knew who were African American who didn't know how to swim. And I'd heard like stories about why that was and I wanted to do a deep dive into that. And Victoria was interested in the more institutional look at, into why there was pool segregation. I'm working with an animator to create an animated piece that walks us through some major historical moments in the journey of integrating public pools throughout the country. And it starts actually in Africa with these canoeists that were in Ghana who were exceptional swimmers and navigators. So much of that water was unknowable to us, but we were one with the water. We understood its power in our connection to that power. And it takes us all the way to like Olympic gold medalists. In 2016, Simone Manuel becomes the first female Black American swimmer and the first woman of African descent anywhere to win individual gold at the Olympics. She's gonna win gold from lane one, indeed she will! We see where the fight for pool integration intersects with the fight for larger civil rights in the country. And it's just really exciting to do that in this graphic medium. In one of the key events is a family where kids were swimming, and one after another, the kids jumped in to save their cousins. But they did not know how to swim either. One by one, Jatavius Warner, Jamarcus Warner. Children died that day. Warner, the parents, who Charles also couldn't Stewart. swim, were on the shoreline watching this. A family devastated by not knowing how to swim. Six teens drowned in Louisiana River. Even when you think about things like Hurricane Katrina and you hear the reports of the people who drowned in this watery world, um, we're going to have more water or less water depending on where you live. Those people who drowned then most likely didn't know how to swim because of this history. There are real repercussions. So in working with the artists, I wanted to provide them with enough inspiration so that they could do what they do, which is take us on these leaps. We didn't have a lot of pools around us, so there wasn't a lot of opportunity to swim. And as I got older and we moved to new neighborhoods, they were a little bit more available, but at that point, I just was like, I'll just stick my feet in the, <laughs> in the side and that'll be great for me, or I'll just like, you know, maybe wade into the water as far as I can, which I also really enjoyed. The experience of going to a pool and knowing how to swim did not get passed down in nearly the same number among African Americans as it did among whites. And instead, what ended up getting passed down in many black families and within many black communities was a fear of water. All of this is about what do you have access to? Do you have access to a swimming pool? Do you have access to a space that is safe for swimming? And for many, many years, black people in this country did. There's a wonderful image in the exhibition and it's a woman, Mamie Livingston, and she's standing outside a fenced-in pool and she isn't allowed to swim in that pool. Mamie would go on to write to the Baltimore newspaper and help desegregate Baltimore's pools at 17 years old, just asking, why is this happening? Why don't we have our neighborhood pool? 
When you start to think about things like civil rights movement, you think of schools, you think of buses. Well, it's also pools. Many things happened at pools that actually led to the Brown versus Board of Education ruling. Um, and even, you know, 1964, the Civil Rights Act, that was completely related to the protest to desegregate beaches in St. Augustine, Florida. Whether we agree with the Civil Rights Bill or not, and I, of course, do not, it is time to draw back from this problem and take a look down the long road at the end of which somehow we must find harmony. On the other side of town, you had a group of mixed race activists desegregating a motor lodge pool. The manager poured acid into the pool to intimidate the activists to get out of the water. A documentary photographer caught it and it helped get the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed. He tossed cleaning chemicals inside the pool in an effort to get the Negroes to leave. So yeah, we are revealing the, the opposite side where we are painted. And the idea behind these paintings is to create like a stained glass effect for the viewer. It's just silhouettes of, of people made with water to kind of remind ourselves that we are safe around water. We are part of the water and we are the body of water. It's like floating, right? And it, get, it gives a good, good feeling. We had a vision that we wanted to activate the walls and the floors, but we wanted to do it in a way that would allow the building to speak for itself. But then we also wanted to engage artists in a way that they could create something new here by bringing in a collective of artists, aquatic activists, scholars, and influencers, you know, Olympic athletes, championship swimmers who were pioneers through each of these decades that have followed the 70s, the end of the public pool era. My competitive swimming was not magic at first sight. When we first started to compete, we lost a lot of races. Um, and we got a lot of claps for being last to the wall. You know, when I was in Puerto Rico, there was several families there that looked just like my family. When we moved to Tampa, Florida, when I was about nine years old, one of the very first things I noticed was I walked onto a team of 150 kids, and the majority of them were white. So, you know, throughout my swimming career, I definitely had those moments where, you know, I started to get really good in the water and started beating kids that didn't look like me and their parents would ask me, what are you doing at the pool? You know, they'd ask me, why, why aren't you on the track or why aren't you playing basketball? Essentially a mainstream, predominantly black, black sport. Why, why am I not doing something like that? Cullen Jones, Tanika Jamison, Sabir Muhammad, and Maritza Karaya. Their stories taught me that my own success was bigger than me, that my dreams should never be limited by the assumptions of others. The different voices that we're representing, it's encouraging people to perhaps see things from a different perspective than what they may have thought was true or how they even remember their public pools. One of the ways I was able to swim every day and go to a pool every day was my mom worked as a locker room attendant at a pool. You know, going with her every day was the main reason why I joined this team, and this team became a, you know, one of the largest black swim clubs in the country. At 12, junior national team, 13, senior national team. So I was already starting to compete with those Olympic athletes. And in 1996, I watched the Olympic Games in Atlanta and was inspired by Amy Van Dyken, who won four Olympic gold medals. And I said, I want to do that. <laughs> you know, I was like, how do I get there? We really climbed every ladder there was in the sport of swimming as a kid. That led me to a, a full scholarship at Stanford. And it was at Stanford where I really bloomed into a, like a really great competitive swimmer. I had a father who was extremely hard on me, um, told me I embarrassed him. He was ashamed to tell his friends that I didn't make the Olympic team after he had been boasting about me for years. And um, had the media questioning like, why didn't I make it? And almost kind of forgot about me for a couple of years. That was really hard. There's a philosophy of Sankofa. And Sankofa means looking back to your past to move forward to your future, learning all of the lessons that might be bad, but it's, it's the strength and the resilience to continue on. 
So 2004 was a completely different person where I was really focused and I remember going through each of my races from prelims to semifinals to finals, making the Olympic team and just knowing that I broke a barrier. I was the first African American woman to make a U.S. Olympic swim team. I remember the first question from the reporter right as soon as I was done swimming was like, you broke a barrier, like how do you feel? At that very moment, I said, I'm proud to be the first, but I don't want to be the last. And I immediately knew that this was going to be part of my journey. I wanted to continue to break barriers and continue to inspire the next generation at the same time. I love swimming! I wanted people to walk out of this exhibition understanding this history and having a sense of why it's important, why our public space is important to correcting the injustices of democracy, the failures of democracy pushing and pulling to a more just world, which is what the civil rights movement is. It's asking democracy to stand up to its own ideals. I wanted to provide that information, but then have the artist be able to take it somewhere else by creating a platform, in a sense, for you to hear what they have to say or you know, see the artwork that has come from this story through them. It becomes an immersive experience that is jumping off from a history that hasn't served everyone well.